Our text today is from the epistle reading. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred commandment. <clears throat> this is one of the most devastating chapters in the whole Bible full of fierce denunciation, blistering words. You won't find anything to compare to it unless, unless you read the 23rd chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus speaks in scathing language to the religious leaders of his day. The Good Shepherd talking to the wolves in sheep's clothing, that have entered in to the flock of the God. I know I've never heard a sermon on this passage. About the only sermons I hear anymore at a preacher's conference. And preachers do not like to hear God warning the people about preachers. That's the theme here. Just as false prophets entered among the people of old, so false teachers shall enter in among you. He's talking to you about me. And he's been describing these teachers from the opening verse of the chapter. They, he says, they introduce destructive teaching and deny the Lord that bought them. They follow the desires of their sinful human nature and despise authority. They are boastful and arrogant, blaspheming in things they do not understand. They are like brute beasts, creatures of instinct. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they sit at dinner with you. Their eyes are full of adultery. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed. They love the wages of righteousness. And he's just getting warmed up. Now he says... These teachers are springs without water, clouds driven by the wind. Picture a weary caravan making its way through the desert. The travelers are dying of thirst. Their tongues are cleaving to the roofs of their mouths. Their lips are cracked and bleeding. They're desperately trying to reach the oasis which lies up ahead. And when they do, the springs are dry. No water. Envision the fleecy clouds above, full of rain, which alone can revive the parched and withered earth. But they're driven by the wind this way and that way, and not a single drop of moisture falls. False teachers are empty and unstable. They deceive you, and then they disappoint you. They promise you, but they don't deliver. They don't have Christ. Who alone can make the claim that Jesus made? He that cometh unto me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. God so constructed you that you are satisfied only by what he can fill. You are empty till he alone can take care of you. Jesus speaks to all of those who are tired of life. See no reason for going on. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He, he, he calls to you who nobody else wants. The least of you. The last. And the lost. 
and assures you, him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Have you got a dryness of spirit? Is your life like a weary land? And you've got to have some refreshment. Whosoever shall drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. And the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. That's what Jesus said. In contrast, the false teacher's mouth empty boastful work. They appeal to the desires of your sinful human nature. They entice people who are just escaping from the... They target the new Christian, the recent converts, those who are trying to get out of the tentacles of corruption in which they long lived. And they bait them by appealing to their sinful human nature. For 250 bucks, I can send you to a religious seminar not far from here where you can hear a preacher speak on the theme, to know me is to love me. I'm not making that up. People love it. But what is it? But an appeal to your self-centered human nature. Not a week goes by, not one, when somebody doesn't want to sell us something to make our life easier, richer, fuller, bigger, more pleasant, and secure. And they offer insights, programs, systems, merchandise of every imaginable sort. But it isn't Jesus. One of the young fellows of our church in the military, stationed in the Southwest, going with a girlfriend who did not have much of a religious background, decided he better take her to church. So he located a place. And in the pulpit that Sunday was one of these professional fundraisers. Plan giving counsel or whatever they call themselves nowadays. And the girlfriend came away with the impression that his religion is just one more money making scam like all the others. Made me madder in hell. He was telling us. Most of all at himself. Just a bit, I should have got up and walked out of there the instant they started that dog and pony show. But angry with the older men in that congregation who condoned it, who sat right there and never made a peep. No military drill instructor will let some clown come in and undermine the morale of his troops. But you don't know what you're going to get from a pulpit anymore. And that's what he's saying here. They promise them freedom. Oh, you're free to do whatever you want. A good old God will forgive you. While they themselves are the slaves of depravity, for a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. You and I think of sin as an impulse, a misdeed, a moral failure. Oh, no, no. The Bible speaks of sin as a power, a compelling force. You can't serve two masters, but by golly, you're going to serve one. The young woman moving out of the apartments next door to us called down, asked of my daughters could use some of the clothes she wanted to get rid of. Shirts, skirts, sweaters. They're in good condition, she said. 
good condition. They were still in the package. They had never been opened. And she says to me, I'm a shopaholic. I never heard that word before. I know about addictions to food and drink and drugs and sex and even your job. Workaholics. But she said she got a rush. As soon as she wheeled into the parking lot at the mall. The letdown came after she got back home with things she bought beyond any conceivable need or purpose because they could not satisfy the hunger within her that drove her to max out all of her credit cards so that she could not even pay the rent. What would you advise? Treatment? Therapy? Or deliverance in the name of Jesus Christ? A new birth and a new life in the renewing power of the Holy Spirit. See? Shifts on you, doesn't it? From therapy to the deliverance only Jesus can give you. Well, what are you listening to today? And then he says, if, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord Jesus Christ, and then become entangled in it again, they're worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn their backs on the sacred commandment. And a doctor will tell you that a relapse is always worse. Your resistance is lower. Your body strength is at low ebb. You get pneumonia two weeks after you had it the first, you're in trouble. Don't buy the line. Once a Christian, always a Christian. The Bible says, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There are many outstanding examples of this. Who ever made a better beginning than the man saw towering figure of physical beauty chosen by God, anointed by the prophet. The people's choice as Israel's first king. And whoever came to a sadder end with no friend on earth, in heaven, to stand by him from the witch's cave at Endor to the battlefield of Gilboa, where he died by his own hand, his headless torso swinging in the wind on the fortress walls of Bashan. Think of Judas, one of the twelve. So how could anybody who's been lightened from on high who is shared in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, who has tasted the goodness of God's word, then go back to where he was before. What would you compare that to? Well, Peter says, it's a, a proverb. He said, it's like a dog returning to its vomit. Like a sow that's been washed, wallowing again in the mud. Jesus used the same imagery. Give not that which is holy unto dogs. Cast ye not your pearls before swine, lest they trample them and then turn and rend you to pieces. But his point here is a dog, when he's sick, knows enough how to get rid of it. 
Problem is, he goes back to sniffing it and then eating it. And a pig, no matter how clean you wash her, is going to go back to wallowing in the mud. Just animals. Just instinct. But you are not. Made a little higher than the animal. God made you a little lower than the angels. These are rough words. The danger is great. The stakes are high. Your souls are suspended in the balance. You got a doctor who's a quack, he can ruin your health. A lousy mechanic can wreck the engine in your car. Unscrupulous salesman can rip you off. An unqualified carpenter can wreck your house. But false teaching will destroy your soul, your eternal destiny, undermining God's love for you in Jesus, and then extinguishing the only lamp for your feet and the light for your path that you have to go on. God's word. You got to understand that Peter is a pastor. That's a Latin word for shepherd. Shepherd with a small S. Pastors aren't running for public office. Pastors are not public relations personnel to make everything look good. Pastors are not professors discussing theological fine points in some seminary classroom. Pastors cannot beat around the bush. Pastors cannot pay attention to public polls. Pastors cannot sell you anything. Pastors cannot Experiment with the latest theological fads and theories. Pastors live in a world of sin amid the wreckage of broken dreams, broken homes, broken lives. Pastors are dying men telling dying men where they found life. Pastors are hungry beggars telling hungry beggars where they have found bread. Pastors are to point you to a real shepherd, the good shepherd, to the great physician who can bind up the wounds of body and soul, to the light of the world who will warm you and guide you to the fountain of cleansing, no matter where you came from. Pastors are to take you into the green pastures and by the still waters of God's word to nourish your souls for all eternity. Amen.